um, that uh, some of basic, some of the basic control flow makes sense, um, and especially your statements and loops, and make sure that you're all aware of a. Um, oops. Make sure that you're all aware of another type of another type of for loop that we didn't uh, that we didn't actually go over last time, so that everyone knows what that syntax is. And what it is. So. Um, okay, so why don't we start by repeating something that we've done before, um, which is a really simple unit, a really simple unit conversion problem. So let's say we're writing a uh, an amount, uh, a, a unit conversion app, and there are several in the app store. I think they're all 99 cents. Uh, but let's say we want to convert miles to kilometers. What's one step that we might do to start this conversion, Sean? Um, I want to convert miles to kilometers. What's a piece of data that I might have to know in order to make that happen? The conversion rate. That's right. So, which one? Which one would you prefer? Uh, miles per kilometer or kilometers per mile? Miles per kilometer. Miles per kilometer. Do you know what that number is? Anyone? Constantine. 1.6. 1.6? 2.2. Give it away. Thank you. 
it's printing the literal. So what do we actually do? What do you actually do? What do you do? What do you do? What do you do? Quotes. What is the what are the quotes you take? Bring what's inside. Bring what's inside. But the quotes themselves. Right. It is a it is a string, right? In terms. So I've actually wrote a literal like a literal value. What is the what is that slash that slash paren syntax mean? Um, well, it puts whatever value you're referencing in, 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 inside of it. Into the, into the string. Into the string. Right. So, you know what that process is called? What the, what the fancy multisyllabic word is that describes that operation? Uh, I don't remember the terminology. You don't remember the terminology? Okay, that's all right. You said before, interpolation. Interpolation. It's called interpolation. We have successfully written a string that displays the operation that we want to perform. How do we actually perform that operation? Uh, we get set a new variable. Okay. And then call it, let's call it result. And then set that equal to miles per kilometer times kilometers. I just have
explicit typing is like. This is when I say a variable, but I'm going to just tell Swift I want this to be doubles, and you and you just deal with it. Awesome. Actually, probably something that uh, Swift programmers should do more often. But there's a version of the there's a version of the universe where um, it's actually preferable to do this most of the time. So great. A few minutes left. All right. Let's take this. Let's take this and do something with it. With it. Let's write an if statement that has a value that uh, that we can test against. So let me let me let's imagine a world where um, 3.1 3.1 miles is just too far for me. Let's say let's say I can only run two miles before I I fall apart. Just pretty much what my limit is. Um, how would I express that using a, an if statement? Or how would I express the fact? How would I express that if I run more than two miles and using this using this uh, variable result um, that I would fall that I would fall down and, uh, and hurt myself? Less than two. Less than two. And then what? Right. So anyway, let me 
let me pause a moment there and, and go back to this word that you said, nested. Okay? Sometimes we're going to say this word nesting, and it's really important to know what it means. Um, this construct where we have braces that call out some lines of code, that turns those lines of code into a unit that we can talk about called a block. Um, whenever we have blocks within blocks, like braces within braces, we usually call that nesting. It's like, it's like Russian dolls, a doll inside of a doll, inside of a doll, and they're nestled inside of each other. So, um, so what Eric has just pointed out is that, is that this, this set of lines we only get to if the result is less than two. But if we get down here, we know that the result is less than two. But the if statement, this, this condition inside this if statement, automatically does away with all cases less than two. I did not observe right. that you did it. Aha, yes. Ah, okay. That's okay. That's okay, because it points out great points okay. that we can, uh, that we can expose to the rest of the class. So, in that case, um, how, yes. how, might we, how might we fix this?
never get here to even check, right? Because by definition, this block is executed only if this evaluates to true. If and only if, as we say, this evaluates to true. Yeah. Right? Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, I guess my the question was why couldn't why doesn't it work? If you just do else if on that now. On it now? Yeah. So because then I run into this problem. Let's check it out. Oh, what's going on? Is Swift going to give us a reasonable <laughs> error here? Is he going to tell us gibberish? Expected expression. Expected to write an expression. That's like the most generic error. Like, so in somewhere in the back end of Swift, in the hind end of Swift, there's this gigantic if else clause. Then at the very end, it says in the else down below, it says expected expression. It's like, I don't know what went wrong, but I'm going to tell you something that sounds intelligent. So, anyway, given this syntax, can anyone see what's wrong with how this is written at all? No. So, Ned, any idea? Uh, what am I missing to make this correct? It's still part of, it's still nested in the first bit. That's right. How do I unnest it? If I were just to insert a couple of things here, any ideas about that? Yeah, bracket after on the K on the next line. On okay. The Which brace would I put in? Closing or opening? Close. Close brace. Quick. Run. Run our way. Art. What would I do next? I still have an error. Um, make a I'm sorry. Um, what's the error? He's the strangest brace at top level. He's a smart man. He's a fantastic. It's exactly <laughs> what I wanted to happen. <laughs> okay. Awesome. So, if you have, I'm sorry. It says, so erase it, erase it. That's right. That's just erase it, right? It even says, it even tells us here. Have any of you used this feature yet? Anyone Anyone use the error feature? The did it get you into, I'm sorry? The fix it? The fix it. Yeah, the fix it. Oh, was, did, it get you into, did it get you into trouble or did it work? Yeah, no, it didn't work. It didn't work. Yeah, like, not so, not be very aware. You can never ever leave Xcode or the playgrounds on autopilot. You have to know what's going on. But if I do this, I think it actually works out. So if I were to change result to 2.5, you can, you can still do it. Um, the, only other, the only other critique I would have is to say that um, the indentation is a, implying something here that is not true. Um, so that's how Swift is mostly white space agnostic, meaning that most of the time adding spaces and tabs or adding spaces doesn't mean anything. But by convention, we always want to write series of else if statements so that they live on the same line of indentation. So we want to stick we want to stick to formatting our code kind of like this. Because then when another programmer comes and reads it, and you're going to be working a lot in pairs throughout, throughout the rest of the course, that someone can look at this and immediately say, oh, this, depend, like, this depends on this guy, which depends on this guy, because they're all indented properly. Once you start messing with indentation, then the game is off. So that phenomenon that we call nesting, you want to use indentation to indicate nesting, because then it helps somebody see like, oh, this is this is independent of the clause that it's in, and it's uh, and it's nested within it, so it still depends on the outer clause. Does that make sense? <clears throat> another another thing that you might notice me doing is I'm trying to test every case I can think of. For these, for these are statements. I want to make sure that I can hit every clause and that it's hitting values that I, uh, that, that I expect and conditions that I expect to have. So whenever you have these, whenever you have multiple else if statements, you know they're one mutually exclusive, so you can't ever hit more than one. So you want to make sure that the values that they depend on actually are meaningful. You don't want to write gigantic if statements that, you, that have clauses that are never executed. I have one critique. Yes. I don't like the variable result. You don't like the variable result? Why don't you like the variable result? Because 800 lines later, if I'm just working on like a particular piece of code, I don't know what result is. Ah, indeed. Allison, you have a better name for result. Looking at what we've written so far. Pick a word 
it's on the screen. Um, not sure. Result of... What are we computing? Study the man. What are we What are we computing on that line? <coughs> like we're doing a unit conversion. So we have uh, we have a number of kilometers, and we're trying to convert it to miles. That's right. Remember the giraffe. Remember the giraffe. Okay. It's an inside joke. But I was going to Is it possible to change the name if you change now result to change everything after that? No, not yet. Not yet. This isn't going to work. Is this semantic? Or, is this semantic, or is it just finding the place? Wait, are you referring to like changing that variable thing? If now I change the result with miles, is there a possibility <laughs> to change it automatically during the whole code with miles? That's what it's happening. I don't know what's going on, but um, the answer is yes, and I'm going to show you right now how to do it. Okay. Did you um, do that on purpose? I didn't. Get, what did I walk over there? And press the <laughs>
know which two that I have. We talked about the last ones. Uh, okay. Are the two kinds of loops that are available to me? Do you know what they are? Four. Wild. And wild. Excellent. Aaron, why don't we start with a wild loop? Start us off. Let's say, let's say I want to test all the possible values between what would be two practical numbers that I could choose for the values of miles that I would want to test? Just pick a range. Uh, one to fifty. One to fifty. Awesome. So, um, Constantine, how would I express that I want to test all the values of miles between one and fifty using a while? Using a while. So what's the first thing that I might have to do? If miles. Yeah, talk it out. Give me some. Give me what we call pseudocode for how for the logic behind this. Thing. So we are trying to uh, find miles between one and fifty. One and fifty. Yeah. So what might I have to do first? One. One. Less than or equal to 50. Less than or equal to 50. Is that correct? No, that's correct. All right, Allison, I know you know how to do this. How would I turn that into a while loop? What are the things that I have to do? Um, there, are, there are a couple of things I have to do to make this work. What's the variable? Miles. Sorry. What? Yes. So, where would I where would I put that? Is it miles miles is less than. Excellent. Okay. Now. Now, Allison, what else do I have to do? Um, You're not Allison. You're not Allison. It's not Ricky. <laughs> You're getting the questions right, but. I'm missing two things. One is syntax, like I'm missing some characters here, and the other is semantic, meaning like I'm not doing some operation that would make it make the make the thing work. So um, what do you pick pick one or the other? It's missing a bracket. It's missing it's missing the brackets, it's missing braces. I all want to get you in the habit of calling them braces. I know you want I know the literature says bracket, so I mean, this will be a fight the, con the, the whole way, but where would I insert my braces? There's one. Where would I insert the other one? Um, at the bottom. At the bottom. <coughs> I, I wouldn't recommend doing that. Okay. Why wouldn't you recommend that? that doing that, Angel? Uh, well, no, you don't answer the question. <laughs> yeah, Angel, doesn't, Angel doesn't like that. Eric, why doesn't Angel like that? Why doesn't Angel like that? Well, Insert that brace right here, Raj. What would happen? Oh, you need to include that. Yeah, if I were to include all this and put a brace here, you're not wrong, by the way. You're absolutely right in what needs to happen. But there's a side effect of that problem, and that's what I'm that's what I'm asking Raj about. Okay? Because if we weren't to do this other thing, my computer would crash. So, Raj, what's the problem with putting a brace here? What's missing? Sorry? Any ideas? Entire class. Any ideas about what is missing out of this loop that would make completing completing this clause problematic? Let's, let's walk through it. Miles is equal to 1. And then I come down here. It's greater than equal to 1 and less than 50. Is that true? Yes. 
For now, it's true. So then I get down here and I say, if miles is less than 2, then print I'm OK. Is miles less than 2 true? Yes. So I, I print that. And then I come down here, and if there were a brace here, I'll see what happens when I reach the last brace. It repeats. It repeats. So I go back up here, and then I check this clause. What's the value of miles at that point? All right. Still one. Still one. Holy cow. And I repeat the whole thing over again. And then I get the same result. I'm OK. And I come down here and I repeat. And the value of miles is 1. Holy crap. So if miles is always 1, does this ever finish ever? No. No. That's a problem because playgrounds suck. <laughs> the playground interface is not very friendly with such phenomena. We call that an infinite loop. And it's um, something that you leverage on occasion in very peculiar circumstances when you're an advanced programmer doing crazy stuff. But for now, it's bad. So how can we ensure that this is not an infinite loop? Right. I'm sorry, add break. Add, add, we can add break, but where would we add it? It's not going to change. I'm sorry? It's not going to change. But it's not going to change, right? Allison, how would I make miles change? So, what happened? I was okay once, I, I, I can still do it, and then I died 48 times. <laughs> um, because ultra marathoning is not my thing if like, I'm crapping out between mile two and three. Right? Okay, so there's a while, there's a while loop. In order to expedite our, in order to expedite our class, I will show you what the equivalent for loops are like. So, if I were to write this as a for loop, I would write this. Oops, sorry. I was not for So this is practically the same thing, but instead of, instead of miles, I'm using M here. Um, you don't have to use single letters all the time. I just want to separate this out. Like maybe I'll use MI just to, just to change things up a little bit. But this statement is precisely equivalent to this one. This expression here, precisely the same as this one. And this expression here, precisely the same as this one, right? except for the different variables. So this pattern that we just went through here is actually a pattern that this syntax is designed for. Right. Initial condition, initialize a variable that I'm going to use to count. Write some condition that determines when I should repeat the loop. And this to change something to ensure that it eventually terminates. While loops are useful when this condition is more complex or less related to counting. Right? Like 
for loops are very much in this syntax designed for a kind of mathematical counting. While loops, like, we could have some completely crazy condition here, like, while a user has not answered a question, kind of, kind of logic. Does that make sense? So, just to, so whenever we show equivalent, whenever we show equivalent syntax, it's for the purpose of showing the syntax, not for telling you that these are created equal in all situations. Does that make sense? Like, this has some purpose, this has a different purpose, they can, those purposes overlap at some times, but generally, um, it's good, you'll get a feel for where these loops are useful and where they're, and which ones are not useful, given the situation. Um, there is one, there's one syntax that we did not go over officially in class. It's called a for in, I say, for in. Or is it for each? Did you guys say for no, each? No, for in, but for each. Oh, you don't want to do for each. Yep, yep, yep. I want to do for, I think it's, they call it for in. I think they call it for in. No, they call it for in. Okay. I mean, I call it for each, but, so do I. but it's, a, it's written for it's in. It's written for in. So for in syntax, or sometimes we will say for each. All right. So there's one particular syntax um, of a for loop that deals with discrete quantities of numbers. Um, those quantities can be, or those collections of numbers, rather, discrete collections of numbers. Those collections can be described in multiple ways. One of those ways is with a phenomenon we call data structures. So we're going over data structures in a few less a few lessons from now. That's where we can take values and combine them into just into a really terse syntax, but a syntax that represents thousands or even billions of values with one little expression. There's another type of collection that we call a range. And it has a very peculiar syntax. And it's used in completely for counting. I want to show you what those syntaxes look like because you're going to see them from now on fairly common. So it looks like this. So this for loop, is, the playground is polite enough to tell me this for loop has been executed 11 times. It's, the syntax is for, and then a variable, and then the keyword in, and then this funky looking syntax, and then a block. It's going to be executed. This funky looking syntax has a couple of different versions, and I'm going to show you here in a second what the most useful ones are. But generally what this means is the value x is going to be initialized at 0, and I'm going to continue executing this loop until it equals 10 by adding 1. Make sense? So if I, if I look over here, these are all the values. These are my values of x. They start at 0, and it goes all the way to 10. What just happened? I'm sorry? What just happened? When you did print line, why did it start at 5? Oh, there's a bug where all the print lines are offset by 50% inside the scroll context. So, yeah, exactly. Okay. No idea what's going on. So I'm just going to put x here, which is completely invalid inside of the map, by the way. But nevertheless, will show me the values of x. So you see how this works? 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So this, this range here, this is a counting syntax that enables us to just quickly count from any given number to another number. This is what we call inclusive. Which means we include the number 10. So if I were to change this 5, dot, 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 10, x starts at 5 and goes all the way to 10. That's six numbers. Does that make sense? Here's another, here's another syntax that I think is more useful. This looks almost the same, but instead of a dot in the third slot, that operator, dot, 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 I have a less than sign. So dot, dot, less than. Or dot, dot, sharp. Sometimes we say open sharp. Here, 
if I inspect the values, I only go to 9. And I never reach 10. So the range actually describes all the integers from 0 to 9. So we call this syntax exclusive. Are they integers? That's a good question. I think they're all, I think they're all integers. Um, you can hack this. I'm not sure if it actually works. Yeah, no, I think it's always, I think it's always integers. That's right. Cannot be applied to doubles. Is it always integers? I think the answer is I think the answer is yes. If that operator only works for integers. The in operator? No, the, the dot dot. Oh, oh sharp, sharp actually. Yeah, dot dot sharp or dot dot dot. Alright. Does that make sense? How these operators work? Counting operators, integers, lower bound, upper bound, inclusive or exclusive. Right? And that just that just inclusive or exclusive determines whether I'm including the upper bound or not in my range. Make sense? Okay. Excellent. All right. We'll pause here for a second. Any questions about variables, types, values, loops, if statements in general? As far as the universe of So I think, I think we can move on to the bulk of the lesson, which is introduction into functions. Um, all right. Let's get, uh, let's get that control flow kind of out of our brains for a second. So we're going to introduce some new concepts, some new syntax, and something fundamental that we, that, uh, this is kind of mathematically related, but has been extended for our use in the world of computer programming. Functions. Um, functions. Functions are set a series of repeatable steps. So what a function enables you to do is take a chunk of code and say, I want to take this chunk of code and execute it wherever I want, whenever I want. It's like a way of what we call encapsulating. It's like taking your code and putting it into a basket, but you can put you can put that basket anywhere. It's like tools that are like a toolbox, perhaps. So I can move the toolbox anywhere and I can repeat it in different contexts. So right now it's been pretty cumbersome. If we want to reuse code, we can we have to copy and paste it, uh, move it, and uh, and repeat ourselves. Um, this is a way so that we don't have to repeat ourselves. It's mathematical in the sense that we have inputs and outputs from a function. We have values that we can put into a function, which is kind of like a 